it's a real honor and a pleasure to sit across from an admiral. It always is. Oh, but, thank you, Jim. But particularly you. Uh, and you had Mike Rogers yesterday, so I, no, I you mean that sincerely. I did, and we, just so you know, <laughs> we were a trending topic on Twitter yesterday. So uh, if you okay. want to compete, you know, just uh, have I need to. to talk about cyber. <laughs> Got yeah. it. Um, or just make some news, you know. <laughs> Cameras are rolling. But uh, the admiral's biography precedes her, but, but among the numerous accolades as being the first woman promoted, promoted to four-star admiral, but also the first African-American woman to attain four-star rank in the history of the DOD. Uh, currently, vice chair of Naval vice Ops. Vice chief. Vice chief of Naval Ops. Um, as, as Peter mentioned, I spent some time in China, but China is also very much in the news, but also very much uh, at the center of this question of the, of the future of war and how the Navy sees the future of war. So I wanted to start there. Um, during my time in China, a great deal of focus, uh, w which continues today, is on China's military efforts to neutralize America's naval advantage in the region, uh, specific weapon systems be being developed for that very task. Um, I wonder if you can, in an unclassified way, uh, describe the state of those efforts. How far is China along? Um, and what is the U.S. doing about it? So every, every nation um, has their own perspective mm -hmm. of what it is required to defend their nation or to uh, uh, be able to uh, sustain the territories of, mm -hmm. of their nations. I think what we're seeing with China is um, sort of an expansive view of what that territory is. Mm -hmm. And you look at the uh, air defense zone that they yeah. established last year. You look at their behavior in the South China Seas, and they're clearly trying to uh, articulate a vision of uh, a territory that goes well out into the maritime domain. Uh, and under international law, those high seas are common to everybody. Mm -hmm. And they're meant to be common to everybody the way the history of the world evolved. Yeah. That's where the trade of the world passes through uh, those lines of communications between major countries. So the entire economic health of the world mm -hmm. depends on those high seas staying free. And that concept goes back to Queen Elizabeth I, who said it's for the public good mm -hmm. that uh, these seas are free. So now you have a country who's uh, maturing. Uh, and they often refer to themselves as maturing and then starting to stretch their muscles in terms of who they are and how they see themselves as a world power. Mm -hmm. So the question I think every country asks for itself is, can you be a global power without military strength? Mm -hmm. And I would say China's going down the path where they're saying, in order to be a global power, we need to have military strength. Uh, the world is three quarters water. We have to be able to uh, defend our maritime domain, we're a maritime nation, and so they're going down that path the way many other countries before them have gone, whether it's the United Kingdom or the United States uh, when we sailed the Great White Fleet and did our first power projection. Yeah. So then we as armed forces have always uh, leaned on innovation in America and technological advantage. Uh, and that is one of our strengths as a nation and then as militaries. Uh, and so then for other countries to come along and go, wow, that's how I have a strong military is to look at innovation and technological advantage and to get some of that for myself. That is incredibly understandable. Uh, so uh, in that case, they're copying what's been successful. Makes a lot of sense to me. Now, do I as a military person want to maintain that military advantage? Mm -hmm. Oh, you betcha. Mm -hmm. And so we continue to uh, acquire and adapt and try and maintain, you know, more laps around the track than China or Russia or anyone else. Are you able to stay ahead of them considering the enormous resources they're throwing at this? Yes, and we mm -hmm. have to stay ahead of them. Mm -hmm. We do. Are there particular weapon systems that keep you up at night? You know, it's not weapon systems that mm -hmm. keep me up at night. It's, uh, uh, if you were saying what, what would cause you to lose sleep, it's individuals. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I think about North Korea and the capriciousness of uh, the leader. That th when you have 
governments or leaderships where they have a certain amount of power or strength underneath them. Uh, and then um, the leadership uh, does not seem to operate in a framework that is uh, logical or understandable, then that, that creates a challenge. Understood. I do want to get into North Korea. On China, the, the personal factor is important as well, and a great deal of effort and progress, frankly, in the last couple of years has been devoted to military-to-military -military contact, uh, in large part to prevent myth misunderstandings, which can snowball and lead, lead to bad things. Um, but there are you know, concerns about, if not particular well, individuals as well as groups and power centers in the Chinese government, particularly the, the PLA, the military, how that relates to Beijing. Um, Xi Jinping, no one questions his military credentials, but still it's a big country with a lot of power centers. Do you still have concerns that there are some in the Chinese military power structure who are more forward leaning about challenging uh, the US? Well, we've made some tremendous progress uh, when you talk about military to military relations relationship. Uh, the Chief of Naval Operations has had several engagements with uh, his counterpart, CNO Wu. Uh, and then last year uh, at the Western Pacific Naval Symposium, uh, all the like-minded nations from that area uh, and then uh, the United States all agreed to adopt a code of uh, for unexpected encounters at sea so that we have a way at the tactical level for our ships to communicate with each other to alleviate that misunderstanding that you talked about. So there's been great dialogue and uh, great uh, movement, I think, between our navies. And um, it takes the leadership of someone like CNO Wu to make sure that within his navy, that when he says, yes, this is something we're gonna do, that the down to the ship CO, that they actually adopt those activities and then are willing to communicate at sea with the other nations that are out there. You know, when, you, when you speak of the future of war, I mean, one of the, th the threats, and it transcends China certainly, because it goes to what's happening in the Ukraine now with Russia, uh, but, but, but many draw a line between the two, and that you have countries that challenge not just the order, but, but the rule of law, and, and settling disputes by peaceful means, and taking territory that's not theirs, <laughs> in the simplest terms, whether in Ukraine or in the Spratlys, or if you're talking about China. When you look at that, I mean, because you know, the two sides are, and the, this is the Chinese phrase, but a new kind of superpower relationship, right? That China can rise without knocking heads with the US, uh, um, which is a nice thought and may be possible, but there are areas where you see where China and the US will knock heads, and right now, as China's building, for instance, um, uh, you know, landing strips, you know, in the middle of that area you described, which is open ocean. Um, do you see, I mean, it's one thing to be able to talk ship to ship and talk military to military so you don't actually shoot at, shoot at each other in a small scale thing, but how about big picture? I mean, are those tensions, are those differences so great between China's strategic goals in the region and U.S. interests in maintaining its very influential role in the region? I mean, do you see that that's, that those can be settled or if, if over time invariably they so the world is always a magical place. I mean, yeah. there's always a number of alternative futures that yeah. can unfold. Uh, and you can look at it from potential conflict, that's one alternate future. You can look at it uh, on the strength of the, the uh, trade partnership we have with China, that's one future. And it's not just with China, it's with the entire Pacific region when you look at Japan and you look at India uh, and then you look at South Korea. So then that says, okay, there's a managed future based on shared economic health. Uh, that's a future. So it's not just within the militaries or Department of Defense. It's the entire governments that have to go. There's alternative futures here. And what are we doing to walk down a path that walks away from conflict or creates the uh, stepping stones to conflict? When you meet your Chinese counterparts, do you look across the table at them, uh, across the cups of tea <laughs> where, where you meet and, and say, this is someone I can work with or this is someone I'm worried about? Uh, well, when we're meeting, normally it's in, in, a, in, a, in a forum where we're meant to be trying to work together. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's what we have been focusing on is what we have in common as naval officers. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a heritage of the sea that makes it 
a pretty great starting point for a com conversation and an understanding between us as professional officers that, okay, if, if not friends, then mutual respect. Mm -hmm. And that could be just as great an end state. Okay. If we could talk about weapon systems that factor into the question of the future of war, and this sort of follows on to this effort by China to neutralize, for instance, uh, or, or weaken the advantage of aircraft carriers, you know, ICBMs, targeted aircraft carriers, uh, uh, surf, uh, shore to ship, uh, you know, missile systems. Is the age of the carrier waning? Has it peaked? Is, is it uh, over time? Is the sub the, the 21st century weapon? Well, so we fight in an integrated way, and it's interesting mm -hmm. because through the different wars, uh, as the different technology was created, all of those were used. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's easy to focus on, okay, World War II, and you think, and you go, oh, gosh, Kerry was the centerpiece, but then we forget about the wolf packs in the Atlantic. Right. Uh, so the, the domains exist, the air, the surface, the subsurface, space now, and then cyber. And we have to be able to operate and integrate in all of those domains. Mm -hmm. So air power from sea to land is asymmetrical. And I, for one, would not want to give up that, right. that great option. Okay. So carriers still, and, and this is something China's pursuing, obviously, as well. So they must yes. think that, that there's a future to the carrier. Yes, and the British are coming back. Are they? Yeah. Are they? Do they have aircraft for the aircraft for oh, their, they're going uh, to go with <laughs> uh, uh, JSF with the Bravo okay. variant. Yes, they are. Um, on North Korea, so this is a different. You know, talking about future of war, this is a different kind. You know, it's a rogue state. Um, you know, it has old school, or it's attempting to get old school weapons, ICBMs, etc. Um, in the cyber dimension, the attack on Sony Pictures. Uh, from the officials I talked to, demonstrated greater capability than folks realized they had before they did it. Um, I wonder if, when you look at, for instance, their missile technology, their ability to strike U.S. naval assets, uh, has that moved on faster than you expected? Uh, if so, who's helping them? I mean, where do the North Koreans stand in terms of their threat uh, to... Uh, well, so they've been to... very open and have been admonished by the U.N. that they, uh, you know, continue to pursue nuclear weapons, and they continue to uh, develop um, short to intermediate range ballistic missiles. Uh, they have not stopped that, and they continue to test. Uh, they have conventional forces that they exercise regularly. So they, uh, for the last decades, they have made that a sort of lockstep. Right. We're continuing to go down this path. Uh, and that is probably, when you look at if there is a potential area where we might be, could be aligned with our, our Pacific partners. Yeah. It'd be yeah. uh, China, Russia, everybody. We, mm. we would want North Korea to come off this path that they're coming off. Now that is an area where, from my just experience and understanding, where China has come around a, a good deal in the last couple of years, just purely from our perspective in terms of, well, running out of patience with North Korea, right? Yeah. Um, do, has that changed, the, has it gotten to the degree though where it changes their calculus? Because on the flip side, you know, do they really want a unified Korea? Do they want American forces on their doorstep? All this kind of stuff. Uh, has the threat of a rogue state, nuclear armed with missiles, outweighed their own? Oh, you should ask President own... Xi that. Isn't that interesting? So be, you're, saying, in September. There you're, you're saying that uh, a, a rogue state on your doorstep may be less of a threat to your way of life than a westernized nation well, that's that, not that, my has, well, that has a bed, bath, and beyond. Well, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> it may be, right? I mean, from, from their perspective. Right. Right? Do you so think that's changed? So culturally, that could be uh, more, more of a vulnerability. Yeah. Um, you know, when you think about China and you think about 1.3 billion people mm -hmm. and you think about an emerging sort of middle class, uh, and then you think about how the country is changing and the demographics of one child. Uh, and then as they get to see more and more of the world through the wonder of the internet, um, you wonder how long they can politically yeah. sustain uh, a power structure mm -hmm. that's a committee over all of these folks. And then so the, the, for them, I think men. the struggle right. will be <laughs> the continuing satisfaction of the majority of the people right. and, the, and then their support of the government. Now when you start, when, when Chinese officials hear American officials talk in that uh, vein, 
they get nervous because they're thinking that's exactly what we've imagined we all the time. You, you want to bring us down. You want to yeah. bring us down. You yeah. want a jasmine revolution, you know, that kind of thing, you know. Wow. No, I'm with the Navy. <laughs> 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 I want to see them um, be responsible citizens mm. of the world. Mm. Uh, and, you know, they're, be in compliance uh, with law of the sea and, and, and uh, be a responsible nation. I think they want to see that for themselves, too. Mm. A lot of challenges to the law of the sea right now, though, in, in Asia, aren't there? When you see these landing strips and structures going up and, and the nine dash line extending their territory well down into the south. Well, I don't know if that's so much law of the sea, but just plain old territorial struggle, yeah. but it's between uh, China and Vietnam and the mm. Philippines and Malaysia, so yeah. they, they need to continue to work at sorting that through. Um, I don't want to focus all on the negative. Um, oh, at some point we're going to get to the tyranny of distance. I know, I know, exactly. <laughs> well, I, they're vaguely under that umbrella. Okay. Right? I mean, because when you're talking about weapons and how they... Yeah. No, um, I, I agree. Uh, when you talk about particularly uh, ballistic missiles. So yeah. the, when you look at, there's this great book, uh, Friedman's The World is Flat. Yeah. You know, and it's focused on the connectivity of the digital age. But in reality, all those trons represent something that needs to flow, mm -hmm. whether it's energy, uh, you know, financial data, but there's a physical component when you step outside of right. cyber, uh, when you talk about economies. And so in the physical world, it's still round. Uh, and then for us and for the merchants of the world, those great circle routes, mm -hmm. those are important because they shorten your, your point to point yeah. and they make trade even more possible because, because of the distance of the world, you want to use those great circle routes. But with the invention of physics and technology, it's those same routes that ballistic missiles use. Yeah. And so that reach that comes with a combination of technology and the understanding of the curvature of the Earth, that's what's changed, I think. And that almost has shortened that tyranny of distance. Mm -hmm. In, you know, talking about what I want to, I hope this is related, I think it's related, uh, and it's in the, news, in the good news category, and it's something you were particularly involved with, which is anti-piracy efforts off of Africa, because this is, so that's a long way from the U.S., right? But this goes to trade through a key, yes. key uh, transit point along the, you know, the Red Sea um, into the Indian Ocean. It also gets at this issue of, China participated in this. This was, this was an interesting... China, Russia, yeah, Russia. Malaysia, Singapore. And Korea, all of them far NATO, away from, EU, from home, yes. right? You know, the, the, yes. Showing that you can be several thousand miles from your home shore and still have something that has a direct effect on your home shore. Just as the U.S. says in Asia that, you know, that's an area that's important to us, keep trade flowing even though it's a million miles away. Same there. Um, Maybe the, is there a hopeful sign in the way that worked out? The international, first of all, it worked. You know, not a ship has been, I don't think the ship's been taken for a couple so of they, years. So there's no ships under hostage yeah. control right now. There are mm -hmm. still some folks from different countries underneath hostage control. Um, but with the focus of the navies and then with changing of, of countermeasures, the business model for the pirates right. just finally broke apart. Mm -hmm. But what we are seeing is, um, uh, and so like any, any business model that is even temporarily successful, it tends to get franchised. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to see piracy uh, in the Gulf of Guinea on yeah. the western side of Africa. Uh, and then tracking a little bit of piracy, Straits of Malacca had this problem right. years ago and starting to see a little bit of that come back yeah. up. But something worked there in that international coalition, naval forces from around working together. What do you think worked? Well, one of the uh, beauties of navies is uh, because of the domain, we're very similar. Ships, how we operated ships, how we navigate, how we protect ourselves. Uh, and so then when we get together at sea, it's pretty seamless for us to join up together. Mm -hmm. uh, and then sometimes it's, it's literally nothing more than translation. But just as around the world, there's more and more English speaking people. Mm -hmm. um, at sea, you, you're generally bound to find folks who, who uh, speak English. So uh, it's, it's pretty easy for us to get together and say, okay, let's, let's divide the domain up into sectors, and I've got this part and you've got that mm -hmm. part. I want to ask you about asymmetric warfare, because that very much relates to U.S. maritime security. And I, we're seeing 
several instances of it. I mean, you see in land wars, not your territory, but you see insurgent groups in Iraq certainly taking on the world. But asymmetric is from the sea to land. But, oh, okay, so. fair enough. It works, um, but you, you, we're seeing it in Ukraine right now. I mean, this mm -hmm. sort of, you know, under supposedly undercover invasion. Um, but I wonder, like, a bigger picture message from these things, or at least raises the question, the world's most formidable military, and we certainly have the world's most formidable navy, but you've seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, you've seen in, I mean, Ukraine's not really our fight, but still, you know, it's a challenge to uh, NATO power there, you know, arguably the world's most powerful military alliance. Um, and then, you, so you see major nations learning from that, and I'm sure China is watching as well, is the U.S. military deterrent, particularly in Navy terms, all, you know, 12 carriers, you know, all this, less powerful than it seems? Because we've seen the potential success and power of asymmetric warfare on a number of fronts, and that certainly goes into the cyber area as well, right? You can have small actors, not even nation states, right, who can, who can inflict great damage on very powerful nation states. Is our deterrent less than people imagine? So it's uh, in, the, in the era it's of interesting because we've we've uh, been used as a deterrent force quite frequently in the last mm -hmm. couple of years. Just as uh, we stationed uh, stationed a couple of ships off of, uh, Syria mm -hmm. uh, after the uh, chemical warfare uh, discussion. So um, if anybody was going to reach out and touch Syria, it was going to be missiles from those two ships, right. and then. Uh, when you look at presence and our ability to respond and be there, then uh, just as this came up last year, about the time I became VCNO, uh, it was the George Herbert Walker Bush that was on station in the Gulf and provided first uh, the eyes and ears, non-traditional ISR for the combatant commander, and then uh, the first strikes came off off the carrier. So the, the deterrence, that credible combat power, very visible, uh, is still there and is uh, still employed today. But you see where I'm going with this. I right? know I don't. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen the power of asymmetric tools that have taken on, well, the U.S. in Iraq, for instance, and arguably, I mean, let's not get into that territory, but arguably lost that war, right, with a, the with a deployment of 150,000 troops and all these weapons and, and, and so on. Um, you see right now Russia, with, which, which is not a, you know, a flagged invasion, but really is an invasion. You can put that in the category of asymmetric, which is gaining territory in Europe. You're seeing somewhat asymmetric steps uh, in the South China Sea, China taking territory, but not necessarily marching the PLA you know, onto, onto the Spratleys. Um, and I just wonder if that calls into bigger questions about the invincibility of, of the American military, the American Navy in the 21st century, so because big, big actors and small actors. You're using the word asymmetric, but um, uh, taking it out of maybe the warfare context, you're referring to, in some cases, uh, governmental decisions and then steps before you actually make the decision to go to war. So mm -hmm. if that is indeed you're talking about less the M part of dime and more of the diplomatic informational of what we do, uh, and then they're doing it from an asymmetrical perspective. That's something I think I'd like to think about. In terms of once, once we make a decision to employ military forces, uh, U.S. military forces, we're, we're in for the fight and we're in for the win, and we have no problems using asymmetric capabilities ourselves, from special forces to unmanned, um, vehicles, aerial vehicles, to going from mm -hmm. sea, sea to shore. So the, so the context is a, 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 in what framework are you using the word asymmetrical? And then if you're talking about true war fighting conflict, we employ it ourselves. Where I think the bigger challenge is are getting our arms around the newer asymmetrical pieces that are coming up. You mentioned Sony. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you look at what uh, happened with Estonia in uh, uh, 2007 and eight, with uh, the cyber attacks right. on their government. Mm -hmm. You look at uh, Georgia, uh, networks being brought down before, before the invasion. Uh, and so then, at some point, when we, when we say whatever has happened uh, in this domain that has caused, that we uh, clearly say that is clearly an attack, 
will we have the wherewithal? Is, are we going to confine ourselves to a cyber response, mm -hmm. or will we allow ourselves to do an asymmetric response? Right. Um, and so, I, I get it. You you can take out cyber with cyber, but you can also take out servers with a small diameter bomb. Mm -hmm. Was that on the table in response to North Korea? <laughs> 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 I don't know if you do that over a movie studio, but I'm just asking. <laughs> Um, listen, I know it's a big issue, but it, even in your answer, you, it, it just gets at that asymmetric has so many, so many different permutations, right, today, yes. whether you're talking cyber or actual So you have military. to have the creativity, yeah. and you have to look at what's the, what's the best way to get at the end state I want to get at. Um, this is great. I want to I give the audience a chance uh, to, to ask questions uh, while we still have a number of minutes. Um, uh, so I don't entirely hog you. And I think if we do it like we did last time, are there going to be questions from the web too, or no? Not, not no, in this case. Not. Fair enough. Okay, so, okay. so it's, it's all the audience's territory today. Do we, do we have a microphone again today? Great. Okay, so why don't we start in the middle here? Hi, my name is Al Gombas. I'm from the State Department. There's been uh, some literature lately about um, Russia and China in particular, maybe some other stations, uh, nations as well. Um, challenging the whole concept of the Treaty of Westphalia and the relationships between states. And I'm wondering if you have uh, any thoughts on whether or not um, our desire that they be um, good citizens of the world, as you put it, um, is, is uh, being challenged by the very idea of what defines a good citizen within the world and whether they want to challenge the, the whole paradigm under which we, d we call somebody a good citizen of the world. Actually, I think, um, I think that was first postulated, I'm trying to remember the author, uh, Kagan, The End of Dreams, and that he, he very uh, carefully articulated that when you look at the structure of the UN and you look at the permanent members, uh, and then you look at the way Western governments respond, that the way we often respond to crisis will um, as China and Russia extrapolate what that could mean to them in the future when they do things, that the way we respond to crisis from their perspective would look like that we're threatening their, their sovereign governments. So I think we just have to be recognized that not, not every government in the world is a democracy. And so that when we think about our activities, there's got to be a dialogue with our, with our partners who are on the um, permanent committee in order to help them understand this is very specific to this, to this framework or this set of circumstances. And sometimes it works. Um, I, I, when you talk about have you ever been surprised, mm -hmm. I, I think I was surprised that we got to a UN resolution in Libya mm -hmm. uh, and were able to get to a resolution that everybody agreed to that we could protect citizens on the ground. So sometimes the dialogue does work. How did Libya work out, though? That's another one. Post, it was asymmetrical yeah. from yeah. the sea in terms yeah. of our ability to complete the mission. Mm -hmm. It does raise a, it raises a, an issue that, uh, that that I was touching on earlier, which is when you when you have uh, major adversaries who don't abide by agreements, you know, whether it's the two Minsk agreements that have been signed regarding Ukraine or the Budapest memorandum, you know, going back to Ukraine giving up its nuclear weapons. Um, and then you worry about how other nation states react to that. If, if, for instance, China says, well, if Russia can do it, then why don't, why don't, why don't we do it? That's a, that's a dicey environment for you to have to deal with. It's a dicey environment for state <laughs> For state as well. <laughs> but you got the bigger ships. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, uh, maybe, well, there's a gentleman right here. Uh. Uh, Nicholas Berry, uh, Foreign Policy Forum. Uh, it's not been discussed today, but what worries the White House more than anything else is the probability, which is very low but still there, of war with Iran um, if a deal has not been made. Now, the Navy will be intimately involved in that. And I know you've war-gamed it, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, starting in 2002, and done it periodically since then. Uh, can you tell me, uh, it's going to be dicey, I guess, but uh, what that kind of war would look like? So the last few years, the focus, I think, has been less on a full-blown war 
uh, with Iran or, uh, and then any neighboring states or the U.S. But if you remember, it was just a few years ago that Iran uh, openly threatened to close the Straits of Hormuz. So the focus for us uh, with other navies in the last few years is, okay, what if that happened? And then how do we respond to that? And then how do we get the Straits open? So we've been going through uh, a series of exercises of how we would, with many other nations, and that exercise has become really international. I think the last one had over 30 different nations from around the world where we get together and then we look at, okay, the straits are closed, how would we open them? And then how would we help our GCC partners protect themselves? You didn't describe what the war would look like, though. <laughs> Is it doable? What? Uh, can, the, can the U.S. and, and partners, if they well, could part, gosh, take yes. out the nuclear facilities? Um, and we get a lot of questions about that. Well, different, different questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, you're, if you're already leaped ahead to they have nuclear, they have nuclear uh -huh. weapons and it's that kind of war, that's a different right. question. So this is, a, this is about the Straits of Hormuz and reopening them. Well, let's say that they do get nuclear weapons of an agreement. Oh, yes. Well, wow, that'll be... That's too many ifs. That's that a too? lot of ifs. So okay. think about it. Who has yeah. nuclear weapons now and what's our relationships? I mean, yeah. when we look at where we are with strategic deterrence mm -hmm. in Russia, we grew up lockstep in a relationship in this deterrence uh, partnership. Mm -hmm. And so we have uh, rule sets. We have agreements. Uh, we have communications with each other in case something happens. And then strategic deterrence as a concept seems to have worked mm -hmm. because we have not fought a nuclear war. Right. So then you look at someone like China who's uh, developing a strategic deterrence capability, but we have not grown up lockstep with China. So that's another area I think where there has to be a conversation with China. What does that mean? And then how do we develop these rule sets of conversation and understanding mm -hmm. once you become a nuclear power? So there's, 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 there's a whole lot of steps and everything in between, I think, before you leap to, oh my gosh, right. we're at nuclear war. We have, we have managed with strategic deterrence to avoid that state mm -hmm. with, uh, with Russia. And so obviously I think everybody would say that's a state we need to continue in mm -hmm. for the health of the entire planet. Yeah. Let's hope so. Maybe uh, if we go just another end of the room, back in here in the back. Mo Smolska, Center for American Progress. Um, you spoke about ensuring all sorts of different uh, maritime spaces, including subsurface, and you went through the whole list. Um, one area that you didn't talk about was the Arctic, and is the Navy at all concerned about securing Arctic spaces as the Coast Guard's icebreaker, the Polar Star, ages and gets very close to kind of not the U.S. not having an icebreaker at all. So uh, those are one of that's one of those also interesting questions. So at some point, um, and it's not immediate in the decades. We think there'll be more ice flow, free free flow up there. Um, and if if it eventually gets to the point where there's most ice flow, then at some point you don't need the icebreakers. And so, you know, jokingly, mm -hmm. sometimes I go, if we build these icebreakers, how long are they good for? 10, 15 years, and then it's open ocean. Uh, in terms of the security environment up there right now, there is the Arctic nations. Uh, it, is, it is unfolding along peaceful lines, along normalized lines for energy exploration. It's pretty well understood who has, whose territorial waters there are up there. So the, and the Arctic Council is, is meeting and having reasonable dialogue. So right now the Arctic is, is uh, not at the forefront of potential burgeoning security concerns for, for the armed forces. I think it was, was it Admiral Locklear who said that global warming is the greatest threat to U.S. national security? And he's not the only U.S. official. I think it was him uh, being a fellow Navy person. Do you share that? Well, there's, if, is, as we look at the world and uh, as it warms, it, it will create instability just from different, just from different aspects. So if you, if you look uh, at increased hurricane or typhoon cycles mm -hmm. and then you look at the response of the world for something like super uh, typhoon Hainan, mm -hmm. that, that's not those type of major disasters like the tsunami uh, in uh, Indonesia 
those require a global response. So then you could, you could almost foresee a future where more and more of the resource, resources of the world are trying to respond to uh, natural disasters, weather, shifting weather patterns. If the waters of the world actually start to rise, mm -hmm. uh, most of the population of the world lives within a couple of hundred miles of the coastline. Yeah. Uh, and then you look at uh, infrastructure and, and uh, where major cities are, that, that's going to be a challenge for each and every nation that's got a maritime shore. Yeah. Uh, and then you look in the Pacific, if you look at potential rising waters, you're talking about for some island nations, they yeah. will completely disappear. Yeah. And so then you're looking at the potential of mass migrations, large displaced populations. So that is a, a future, probably decades from now, but a future that we could potentially see unfolding. That's, that's not just a, a US government issue, that is gonna be a world issue. Yeah, the country's already preparing for it, right? The Maldives, they, I yes. think they've, they've yes. been our Curie boss and exit plan. How about over on this side, maybe at the table here and then? Hi, I'm Sharon Burke with New America. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to come back to the asymmetric threat issue and specifically the, the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz. So maritime mines, um, there's a lot of them in the world. There's, they range from they're cheap and dumb to sophisticated and smart patrol boats. Even criminal organizations have submersibles. And so, you know, the Navy's capability to put a lot of eggs in the LCS basket. It's not clear if it's going to deliver on time. You know, how's the it, Navy it approaching has been delivering on time? So the the countermine module, um, and then also, it's kind of along the same lines. I think the CNO has talked, um, and you know, definitely correct me if I'm misstating it, about the difficulty of continuing to invest in very large, expensive platforms, and that looking forward an interesting challenge for the Navy is how to use the big expensive platforms it already has or is building to be a launching point for uh, cheaper technologies, you know, UUVs and things like that, um, that'll give us a different way of, of fighting and of using those big expensive platforms we can't keep building. So that whole picture, could you talk a little bit about that kind of asymmetric threat and whether or not the Navy really has the capability, is it partners, you know, what's the answer? And then looking forward, where the investment stream goes. So we've always had a, a wide variance of functionality at sea. And um, so whenever you're looking at everything that has to happen at sea to be successful in operation, you, you got to have logistics capability. You have to have mine clearance capability. You, and today, what's come to the forefront is probably ballistic missile defense. Uh, and then you have to be able to self-defend the, the an ARGMU or the strike group, and then we often use aviation capability off our platforms to do that as well as missile defense. So along that spectrum of operations and things we have to do at sea, which is everything from humanitarian assistance to disaster relief to the high-end war fight, uh, we build multi-mission ships and then we build ships that have a very focused capability. So generally, we will build ships that are just logistic ships. They could be big ships, but that's their, their primary purpose. And then, when we look at if you have to go into the high end, then, it, then, you, then you think about how do you do the fight. Traditionally, how we've done the fight is for the ships that have less offensive capability, self-defensive capability. The ships with offensive capability go in and make sure we have maritime superior, superiority both under sea and on the surface and in the air before we bring in the other ships. And so then the question becomes, OK, if that is not going to be how we fight in the future, how much defensive capability do these ships need, offensive capability, or do we really start to think about different attributes and change what becomes important in the next fight? And for me, speed is going to be one of those that becomes important in the next fight, speed and ability to uh, move around in the littorals and sort of hide in, hide in plain sight. So I think where we're going with the number of ships we have, destroyers, uh, large-scale combatants, and uh, um, small surface combatants, the LCS, uh, and then with the modified one in the frigate, we've got the right mix of capability to be able to dominate in the maritime domain. And that means you've got to have submarines, you've got to have carriers with air power, 
And then that gives uh, whoever's going to be the operational commander um, the, as the geographic laydown is different in each theater, a lot of different options in how to prosecute a fight. You as well. Uh, sorry, uh, it's probably bad taste for the mic holder to ask a question, but I hope you'll <laughs> forgive me for this one. Um, you've been talking a little bit about agreements, uh, adhering to international agreements, and so my question is regarding the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which, correct me if I'm uh, wrong, but I believe the U.S. has not ratified, although that is uh, correct. Uh, yeah. use it agrees often in terms of international customary law, but so I'm not asking for a policy recommendation from you, but in terms of your day-to-day -day job and um, practical aspects of the job, how does, you know, not having ratified unclose effect or maybe have no effect on, on what you do? So for us, we, particularly for us, because there's the part of the code that is the rules of the road, so to speak, of the sea, we, we stay in compliance with that in order to have safe navigation at sea and to be able to operate in the inter international maritime domain. So we're generally operate in compliance with law of the sea because it's to our health and safety to do so. Um, how about here in the middle? Thank you. Uh, Deanne Divis with Inside GNSS. Up to now, the United States has had uh, broadly speaking, control over satellite navigation. The Russians have a system, but it's had a few hiccups. The Europeans are building a system, and the Chinese are building a system. So our, our allies will have a system that uh, documentation suggests they would like to have incorporated into their weapon systems, and of course the Chinese will have one of their own. How will that change your operations? If our allies want their signals involved, and of course the Chinese have an independent capability. I'm not sure that it would change our operations. I mean, if we have our, our system, so I'm try I don't think I understand your question. Well, if our, our weapon systems have to be compatible across a, a wide range of countries, then would we not have compatibility issues? NATO's already working through some of those. Yeah, I, in, you mean in terms of uh, precision navigation and timing? I, yeah, I, I would say the, uh, when, we're, when we look at, we'll continue to rely on our systems. I'm not sure we're quite ready to go and be compatible with the Chinese. Well, the Chinese would have their Yep. And so we have had the ability to, as I understand it, if, if we want to, we used to have selective availability where you could mess with the signal if you were in a, in a difficult spot. So the Chinese will have a completely independent system and that capability will not be there anymore. So we won't be able to affect the, the ability to use our signal. We can, but it won't matter. Does that make any difference in terms of your operational planning? Uh, okay, so this gets back to the question Jim asked earlier. So as other countries become more technologically advanced, then it's incumbent upon us to understand exactly what that means and then figure out how we either uh, create or get to our own innovation and technological advancement to, to counter that capability if we ever had a need to counter that capability or undermine that capability. We, we got four minutes to go, so I think we probably have time for one more question, unless we're really quick. Um, and I see a gentleman in the back. Great, thanks. Patrick Tucker with Defense One. Uh, the um, aircraft carrier-based drone. Um, oh, the U-class? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So a uh, big topic of debate among a lot of defense tech watchers. This year, it got sort of sent back to the drawing board you got one camp that says it should be very heavily armed, should be the first step towards a more robotic air force, and that's going to increase the relevance of the aircraft carrier. You've got another group that says, no, we want it to do mostly ISR, lightly armed. When you are asked about your opinion of what you want in an aircraft carrier-based drone, what do you tell people? What is the future of aircraft-based carrier drones? So the, to start with, I would like to have maritime ISR from the sea. So then when you look at what is it you believe you need, I'd like to at least start there. And then once you have this platform, as someone else pointed out, then obviously you could you know, look at expanding the missions of that platform and then adding on other capabilities like strike. How, 
So this gets back to when you operate from the sea, that gives you a certain level of impunity because the international waters are open to everybody. And when you look at the George Herbert Walker Bush last year, the first mission those aircraft had, manned aircraft, was non-traditional ISR. Uh, and so that, I, I sit there and go, by golly, that's exactly what we would have wanted to use the U-class for, uh, have, have that overseeing eye 24 hours a day if possible to, instead of manned aircraft. So I, I believe there is a need for, just as someone ashore is going to say, I need ISR at the tactical level, we, I think anybody who operates uh, in a domain where there's conflict would like, wants to have ISR at the tactical level. That's underneath the commander's control. That still leaves us time for one. Uh, I want to go way, way back. And you should know you're in the light, so yes. you have a halo. Oh. <laughs> Well, that'd be the first time. <laughs> uh, this is Sandra Yashalal with Reuters. Um, I wanted to ask you about the comments that have been made by the CNO and others about the limits of stealth. And that has triggered a pretty deep you know, discussion about whether the Navy really intends to go forward with its purchases of the F-35 program. Um, particularly oh given that... Oh my goodness, that, yes. So, <laughs> well, particularly given... a couple of tactical air guys in the audience going, no, yes, we do well, intend it, to pursue F Lightning too. absolutely. Well, I IOC in 18. So you're not lukewarm on this program. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. I, it, this gets back to, you know, how do you fight from the carrier? It's uh, use of tactical air, it's use of strike, so... There's going to be a platform on that carrier, and we're going down the path of Lightning II to replace the Super Hornets. Final thoughts? Uh, so, tyranny of distance. So, we talked just, about. Just go through that topic just, now. Just, and just now, the, the physical seconds. domain <laughs> that we ended up. So, getting back to Thomas Friedman's book, uh -huh. the, the, world, the World is Completely Connected. And uh, you know, it's only been about 22 years since the World Wide Web was born. Mm. Um, so that is the other place where uh, there is no tyranny of distance. Mm. And things move at the speed of light in the cyber domain. And so the challenge, I think, for all of the militaries is we still fight in the physical domain, but we're gonna have to fight at the speed of light at the yeah. same time. And then that gets back to her question on satellites. So when you look at the speed of light and signals, the answer might be disruption. And we have to think about these things, both in that interconnected cyber domain, signals going up to satellite, signals coming, information coming over fiber, and then how do we fight at the speed of light at the same time we fight in knots, 20 to 200, depending on whether you're a surface ship or aircraft, at the same time. And that will be our challenge, but that, is also asymmetrical right. opportunity. No question. Admiral, thanks very much. Thank you.